All right, well, this has been a long time coming. I started off months and months ago playing around on my modeling software, my 3D modeling software, and uh, just playing with some different shapes and some fills and how to repeat a pattern around an object. And what I ended up doing was creating a bell. And I thought it was interesting looking. It's got these sharp ridges on it every, i show it to you this way, maybe you can see they're here, here, here. Uh, and then there's also sort of a, just a, a gentle uh, flute in here, a little, a little ridge. Not really a ridge, maybe a lump, hump, I don't know. But it's not round. It is roundish, but it's not round. And so I couldn't, ca I couldn't make this with a typical strickle sort of setup where you'll see a lot of um, larger bells, especially are cast that way with a strickle. We're going to cast this one in a, in a method uh, that you've seen me do before. I'm going to ram it up. Uh, in a sand mold, I'm going to do a false cope. We're going to we're going to ram up the top half, the cope, the top half first. Turn it over. We'll ram up the base, the uh, drag. Turn it back over. Tear the cope apart. Put some more stuff in. Ram the cope up again, and then we'll pour it. You're also going to see me screw up <laughs> because I uh, well I'll tell you about that in a minute. I'll tell you about that. So let's watch the uh, the pour of the first bell. We're going to see two pours. Uh, the first bell here, and I'll talk about how I screwed it up. All right, so as I said in the intro, we're going to do a false cope. A false cope is really nothing more than a cope that we're going to throw away. <laughs> Run it over. We'll just, we're going to fill this thing up with sand. I'll ram it down pretty hard. But the intent of this false cope is so that I can have the pattern in the right position to ram up the drag or the bottom half of the mold. Now, I know that there's some of you who might be thinking, you know, well, you don't really have to do that. You could just ram this thing up normally uh, and use this, uh, use this cope, just ram the cope first. Problem is I use uh, a tapered sprue and I can't just force a tube down through this, this sand to do that. I really have to ram that tapered sprue into the, uh, into the sand, which means I really need to ram it into the cope while I'm making the cope. Now, I know that you can get tapered sprue cutters, but they're generally pretty good size, and I don't have one. So this is how I'm doing it. I am going to go ahead, uh, pack this sand down in here pretty tightly, turn it over, and then we'll start ramming up the drag. Now, that little hook, that little eye hook there is going to be important. That's what we're going to hang our clapper from, and you'll see me place this down inside there. There's actually a hole drilled in the top of the bell uh, that, that, that the threaded part of that screw will go down into. And I'm just wrapping this thing in there now to loosen it up because I want the pattern to come out when I lift the cope up, the false cope up. I want the pattern to stay with the drag. So we'll go ahead and part it out. Uh, I'm going to place my, my runner in here, my spin trap. Uh, as always, I fill from the bottom to the top. I don't jump my metal down through the top of the bell. And someday we'll get into a little bit reason why I do that. I realize a lot of people do that and have good success and make beautiful bells that sound great. Uh, but I have my reasons for doing what I'm doing. And someday I'll have to get into that for you. And we're just going to fill this guy up. I really should have rammed the inside of that bell a little tighter. Um, I'm ramming it right here now, but I probably should have rammed it a little bit harder or at least not filled it all the way before I started ramming because the top of the bell, the, this inner core, was really pretty soft. And you're going to see it here in a little bit uh, that I had some trouble with that, um, that eyelet, that eye hook and eye bolt, eye whatever, screw, I don't know what it's called, eye something, that thing with a ring that I mount the, the uh, clap or two. Anyway, you'll see me there. I struggled with it um, because it's kind of soft. So we're finished getting this, this uh, uh, the drag, I want to see what I call it, the cope, but the drag rammed up and packed in there nice and tight. Get it flipped over again.
and get the coat taken off. And hopefully that pattern stayed in the drag and it did. So now we've got um, our bell pattern in there. The inside of that bell, as you know, is full of sand now. So I've got a, I've got a core built inside of that, that bell shape. Go ahead and put our tapered sprue in and the other half of our spin trap. There's a vent coming out. That vent will come all the way to the top. Uh, we won't see the metal actually make it to the top of that one. Lots of parting compound. <laughs> I started to do this and realized this is futile. I'll be here for a month and a half trying to sift sand. So I just decided to start dumping it in. I've been doing this more often too. I've been packing things in with my hands just to kind of get them firmed around the the, uh, the pattern, the sprue, the vent, whatever, just to kind of hold things in place. I'm doing an intermediate ram here. The box is not full, the, the cope is not full yet, but I want to make sure that it's packed down tight at the bottom of this thing. And with a full, we can go ahead and ram it again and get the, the, the rest of it tight. Protecting my sprue so I don't hit it with that uh, ramming tool. Now I'm digging out the top of the bell here so I can put this vent in. Uh, I didn't keep it, I didn't put it in when I first ran it up, but we can get it in there now, pack it back down in, and I'll have a vent that comes through the top. This will be really instrumental in knowing that the bell filled uh, when we pour. I get the offset pouring basin cut in here. I'm cutting it a little bit larger than normal uh, just because I wanted to have, I want it to be gracious. <laughs> That's the right way of putting it. I want it to be forgiving. I want to, um, to have some space in there that as I pour, I can I can kind of go up and down and, and keep it smoothed out. Uh, this is cutting a radius on the back edge of that uh, ridge, and we just clean everything up with a with a uh, what do you call that thing? A brush. Now, see so you can see the the gash at the top of the uh, bell or the hole. That's because that eyelet pulled out when I lifted up the pad the cope. It stayed up inside the pattern, and it tore the sand loose. So after we get everything taken out of the mold, we'll go ahead and um, try to get that fixed up once we get everything out of here. Now, I had to wrap this thing quite a bit, the bell pattern, to get it out of the cope, uh, to get it loose enough. And it was a bear to get it out of there. It just did not want to come. Part of the reason is those flutes are kind of twisted as well. It's almost like rifling in a barrel. But we get it out. Cut our gate into the into the bell here. Cutting a fairly good sized gate. Um, I don't want it to. I don't want it to be a choke point. I don't want it to uh, uh, freeze up on me here. And it actually, I cut them by hand like this, and I always cut them thinner than I I think I am. And here's where I'm going to fix that top of that bell. And I just put some sand in that that hole that was torn loose. Um, but as I'm touching it, boy, I can sure feel that the top of that bill is really, really soft. I had to be very careful with the air here because I wanted to blow apart. So with everything blown out, uh, we can put this thing back together again. I really, really should have handles on this thing, which I don't. So now I struggle with my hands, where to put them, where to hold them, how to drop this thing without dropping it. I think I'm down now. Oh, man, it's tough. Here's the pour. We uh, try to keep the uh, basin full, but man, you can see that angle iron sliding around on me. I was kind of a mess here doing a pour. That little button that you saw come up, that was the uh, top of the vent on top of the bell, so I know I made it to the top of the bell. And look, nothing there. <laughs> there it is out of the sand. You can see what it looks like. You can see that ring that's up inside there now, uh, and that is fused into the bronze, so it's not going anywhere. And we'll get it all cleaned up and show it to you. All right, so here's the first bell. And the, what, I, what I did wrong with this bell is I made the wrong alloy. This is a copper 
tin alloy. It is 90% copper, 10% tin. Now bell alloys or bell metal is normally a 20% tin. It's 80-20, not 9010. So uh, not enough tin in this thing. I looked at this bell and I thought, there's something wrong with this bell. <laughs> and I realized it was the color. First, first thing I realized was the color. It was too red. It was more of a, it just has too much of a copper color to it. And after I thought about it for a little bit, I thought, oh, I made the wrong ratio. So then I decided, well, let's go ahead and cast the same thing over again. And we'll cast it with the proper ratio. So let's do that right now. I'm just going to show you the pour here. You can see I've created a large pouring basin again. Uh, and I still had trouble here. I splashed it around and... Uh, you'll see me let it kind of run down there, but I got it kept it full. I think I kept it pretty full. Again, that vent filled, so I'm pretty confident it made it to the top. And once again, I open it up and there is nothing there. There you can see we're taking it out of the sand. It's amazing how wet this sand gets too when you put hot metal in it. Uh, it's like it dries, dries all the moisture away from the, the casting itself and into the sand. All right, now here's that bell uh, cast with the 80-20 uh, ratio. And you can see, maybe you can see the difference. Uh, try to, I don't know if you can tell, but this one is a, is a redder color. This one is more yellow colored. Uh, and that's just a, a, an artifact of the, the amount of tin that we put into this thing. Now, I wanna ring them for you. And uh, this one actually already has, it has a holder. And I just took, just took it off. It mounts on here like this, and this, this will mount to the wall and hold it up just kind of like that. Uh, this one already has the clapper put in it. And you saw, you saw in, that, uh, in the video when I was doing, ramming it all up, you saw me put the ring in there, the hook, uh, to be able to hang this thing. So that's how that works in there, the, hanging off of that. We're not gonna ring it with the clapper though because I, this, this one doesn't have a clapper in it and I wanna ring it exactly the same way. So let me find my steel rod, there it is. And we will ring first the 9010 alloy. So let's listen to it as it rings. Kind of a dull sound, it doesn't ring real bright also doesn't have a ton of sustain to it. Uh, sustain is how long it will ring. Let's compare it to this one. This is the 8020. That one rings a lot louder, a lot clearer, a lot brighter than the first one. So the alloy made a huge difference in the way the bell sounds. Not only that, it made a difference in the way it looked. So, uh, good news is my wife loved them both. <laughs> and they were both gifts for her, so uh, we'll get those hung up here around the, uh, the house somewhere, out in the barn or somewhere, uh, so she can, maybe, maybe she can call in the cowboys for, <laughs> for dinner or something, I don't know. Anyway, that's it. A couple of bells, a couple of fluted bells. Uh, I love the shape. I love the way it came out. It looks, uh, I think it looks great. Uh, I didn't go to a huge degree of polishing on this thing. I uh, kind of wire brushed it and then just ran it on the buffing wheel for a second just to put a little shine on it. Yeah, that's it. You guys have a great day.